Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be talking about a book that I think is definitely going to be going up on my best reads for 2020, and that is Confessions of a Mask by Yukio Mishima. I read this book quite recently for a book club that I'm a member of, and I have to say it is one of the most interesting and moving studies of sexual repression that I've ever read. So obviously I really wanted to talk about it on the channel. Part 1. Summary. Confessions of a Mask is a Japanese novel first published in 1949 under the pseudonym Yukio Mishima. It is a semi-autobiographical novel, with the protagonist's name Ko-chan being the diminutive form of the author's real name, Kimitake. The story is set during World War II in Japan, in an era of right-wing militarism and imperialism, where strength and extreme masculinity are championed. Born into this world with a weak body and a weak constitution, Ko-chan spends much of his early childhood struggling to fit into the norms of his society. During his childhood, he is kept away from other boys, raised in isolation, and surrounded mainly by women. These early experiences, many of which run parallel to Mishima's own experiences, result in a fascination with violence, fantasies of death, and homosexuality. In one of his earliest experiences of his sexuality, Ko-chan becomes fascinated by an image of Joan of Arc, thinking she is male. When he discovers the truth, he is repulsed by the image. During his adolescence, Ko-chan attends a boarding school where he develops sexual feelings towards a rebellious, rugged young man named Omi. During this time, Ko-chan struggles even more to fit in with the ideals of strong masculinity around him, and he becomes obsessed with presenting an image of strength and masculinity, essentially becoming a mask. The title of the book refers to the confessions of this mask. Ko-chan also becomes to believe that everyone around him must also participate in the same reluctant masquerade as he, hiding their true feelings, and this makes him suspicious of others. Part 2. An introspective narrative. So Confessions of a Mask reads a lot more like an autobiographical study than it does a typical novel. Typically in a novel you'll have a character with either a physical or internal uh, problem that they have to overcome, and they go through some things, they face some ob more obstacles, things get worse, and then at the end Everything gets resolved, everything gets better, and, you know, usually you get a happy ending. Or at least, a resolution. Confessions of a Mask doesn't really do any of those things. Ko-chan does have lots of issues going on in his head, but by the end of the novel it isn't clear that he has necessarily resolved any of these issues. Now, Ko-chan does certainly have lots of issues that he works through in the book, and we as readers go along with him on that journey, but by the end of the book, it isn't really clear that any of these issues have been resolved, even if they have been understood a little bit more. Instead, we have a book where the narrator is trying to understand why he has the desires that he has, why he has this fascination with masculinity that he has, and why he is fascinated with some pretty morbid things. And the story is essentially just an exploration of this psyche of this very interesting, very detailed character. Now, the reason I say this is more like an autobiographical study of someone is because, as I said in the summary, this book is autobiographical, or at least semi-autobiographical, and there are many parallels, especially early on in the novel, between Ko-chan and Mishima. As boys, both Mishima and Ko-chan grew up in a predominantly female environment, isolated from men. They also both, when they're young, have an incredibly weak constitution, they're pretty weedy guys, and this led, in Mishima's case, to becoming a bodybuilder later in life. Also, both of them discover that they're gay, and they both have a very unhealthy obsession with very strong forms of masculinity. Now, all these various parts of the novel, all these earlier experiences of Ko-chan, are used in a way that suggests that some of them might explain why he ends up being the way he is, why he has these morbid desires and fantasies, but on the whole it's left open to the reader for us to decide why he becomes the way that he becomes. For instance, it could be that he desires to be an incredibly strong and masculine male, because as a child, he wasn't any of that, and so he resents that and idealises it because he doesn't want to be weak and ill. Or it could be that he wants to hide in the masculine side of things. If he wants to hide his effeminacies being gay, he can do that by trying to emulate one of the more stronger forms of masculinity. So it could be either of these things. It could be a product of his early childhood, or it could be that he becomes fascinated because he wants to hide his sexuality from others. And this is where most of the narrative lies. So it should be pretty obvious then that the book isn't really about plot at all, and in fact, the plot itself is kind of hard to summarise because most of the story takes place in Ko-chan's mind. Even when we have scenes of action, things like conversation, oftentimes you'll get one line of conversation and then there'll be Ko-chan's reflections on that line. So even here, in parts of the book that are focusing on the external world, 
we're always getting brought back to Ko Chan and his mind and his feelings and his interpretation of the events that go on around him. Now this means that a novel that is actually quite short, I think it's only around 100 pages, actually feels a lot longer because it does have a certain rambling style, a prose style, which makes sense given that it is focusing on the minds and the ramblings of Ko Chan. Also it's worth saying that this rambling style is not bad, it's not laborious to read, it's not boring, it's always interesting, so it's not something to uh, criticise. In fact, the intimate first-person narration reminded me a lot of Charlotte Bronte's Villette, which is also a fantastic book of a similar kind. Although Confessions of a Mask is certainly a much darker and more sexual book, in both cases we have these introverted protagonists who spend most of the novel reflecting internally on the things going on around them. Also in both cases, we have characters whose image that they project to the world is very different from the image that we see in their internal monologues. In the case of Villette, we have Lucy Snow, who comes across to others as a very uh, shy, diminutive woman who doesn't really have any passions or deep desires, but inside her mind, she does have all of these things. She's quite witty, she's quite sharp, and she also has deep passions for certain men and women that she cares about. But for Lucy, she's not capable of necessarily projecting these in a way that people outside of her can see. Now with Ko-chan there is a slight difference in that Ko-chan, at least when he grows up in the book, does seem capable of controlling his outward uh, mask, if you like, to others. He seems capable of hiding behind this veil of masculinity so that he's not revealing his true self. But still, we have this falseness in that the image that Ko-chan is projecting is very different from his internal mental life which is much darker, much more subversive, and, well, at some points, it's kind of scary. All of this results in a really beautiful prose style that when you're reading it feels incredibly intimate. It really does feel like you might be reading someone's confessions, which, you know, given the title, is what the author was going for here. This also makes sense given that the novel is autobiographical to an extent. You can certainly feel that Mishima's presence is in the book itself. It's not like he is necessarily idealising himself all that much here. It really feels like an author using prose, using a story to work out his own mental anguish, and it really does pay off and make some beautiful writing. One thing that is worth pointing out with this style of kind of focusing on the internal character is that you really don't get a sense all that much of Japan and the context of the time, and you really don't get much of a sense of the other characters as well. Because Ko-chan is mostly thinking of himself, and his own problems, he really doesn't describe it that much in terms of the people and events that are happening around him. You know, I mentioned in the summary that this novel takes place in, in during World War II, and at one point the atomic bomb drops on Japan, and this really isn't delivered with much fanfare by Ko-chan. It basically feels like a background event in a book, which, given the significance of that, is quite something. Now one explanation for this could be that Japan at this time was kind of used to violence and death, you know, we're talking world wars here, and so it didn't really feel all that real when it happened because people were just kind of used to it, they were kind of numb to death and violence. But another reason for why I think this is kind of background is that Ko-chan as a character is really focused on his own mind and trying to work himself out. This book is essentially his confessions, and so he spends much of the time focusing on himself and Things about the external world only come in if they're relevant to his story, to his mental life. So I don't have much more to say on this, just to reiterate, this is a really good first-person narrative story. The narrator is incredibly complex and interesting, the prose style is really beautiful, and yeah, it's just gorgeous writing and some of the best first-person narration I've ever read. Part 3. An honest look at sexual repression. Confessions of a Mask offers a really stark and honest picture of what it is like to have a desire or a part of your identity, whether it's sexual or not, that you have to conceal from others. I often find that with books on these kinds of themes, they can focus on trying to be uplifting to deliver a positive message, rather than necessarily to get to the harsh and not necessarily happy realities of living in a repressed way. Also, books that try and you know present a positive message can fall into moralising, which is something that I am not a fan of in literature in general, but luckily, for me at least, this book did neither of those two things. I think part of this reason for not necessarily having the most positive message was because Mishima, at least from the research I did on his biography, he didn't seem to be someone who ever fully accepted his sexuality. He always seemed to be conflicted about it. And so this is reflected in the story that we get. We get a very ambiguous story 
And for me, it was this ambiguity that made the novel stand out and also made it a fantastic book about sexuality. I think also, as well as Mishima's biography, the ambiguity of the ending of the story also makes sense given Ko-chan as a narrator. The book is kind of billed as Confessions of a Mask, and so we are getting the confessions or the story of Ko-chan and his mind and the things that go on in there. And so he's still kind of going through the process as he's telling this story to the reader of working out who he is, what his identity is, and how to exist in the world. And so when the confession is done, you know, after that point, it could be that he makes some breakthrough and changes, but we don't know that as the reader, because the story stops really once he's made his confession, once he's said everything that he wants to say about himself. And so the book really does feel like a process of reflection, of self-reflection, both for Ko-chan, also for Mishima, who's writing the book, and also for the reader. So if you do want a feel-good story about sexuality, then this certainly isn't going to be the book for you, but if you want a more honest and, in my view, relatable story of sexual repression, then I think you really will find a lot to relate to in here. I know, at least for me personally, there were several instances of the story where I felt like the things that were going on were things I could completely relate to and understand. I'm thinking here especially of that fascination that Ko-chan has with masculinity growing up, and using masculinity as a way to hide your sexuality from others, a way of making sure that you don't present yourself as too feminine because then people might notice and you don't want people to notice. And so things like this and the effects that that can have on a person and the manias it can develop in that person, I just found were completely relatable and even if, you know, by the end of the novel it wasn't necessarily positive, as a reader I felt like there was a lot to take home from that and to relate to in that. So yeah, ultimately not the happiest, most positive uh, novel about sexuality ever, but certainly an honest one, certainly a dark one, and certainly a, a relatable one, and I would definitely recommend it, even if you tend to prefer your stories about these kinds of things to be more on the positive side. So yeah, it isn't the most positive of stories about sexual repression. But one thing that it is important to notice is it's not necessarily a negative one either, it's just ambiguous, it's somewhere in between, and it's this ambiguousness that makes it such an interesting and rewarding book to read. And as I said, there is still a lot to relate to here, I think, if you've been through these kinds of experiences. Whether, again, it's sexual identity or any kind of identity that you've had to hide, or any part of your personality that you've had to hide, I think you would probably find a lot to relate to in the story. Part 4. Self-delusion and relationships. So one thing that I pointed out earlier in the video was that the character doesn't really develop secondary characters all that much. In fact, of the secondary characters, there are only two that we really get to spend any decent amount of time with. And both of these are Ko-chan's love interests. The first one of these is Omi, the boy he falls in love with at school, or at least becomes has a bit of crush on. And the second one is Sonoko, who is a woman who he tries to fall in love with, again to kind of hide his sexuality. Now, of these two characters, Sonoko is definitely the more fully realised one. She appears more in the book, and Omi really does feel like a idealisation on Ko-chan's part, and this is something that he even um, admits in the narrative. Ultimately, Omi is just a symbol of the masculine man that Ko-chan desires when he's younger and then wants to be when he's older. Sonoko, on the other hand, isn't idealised in this way because Ko-chan isn't in love with women, or doesn't love women, and so we do get a bit more of a sense of character to her. Although, again, not as much as we get with Ko-chan himself. I think the relationship between these two, which is basically what most of the book focuses on, is really well done, and again, Mishima offers a really stark depiction of what it's like to try and fall in love with someone who you just can't fall in love with. We see Ko-chan enjoying his time around Sonoko because she's a nice girl and he enjoys her company, and then trying to project love onto that, you know, trying to think, well, you know, if I like hanging around with her so much, I must feel something stronger. And so we have him trying and trying and trying to do this and always failing. And again, this to me was just something that was really relatable. I remember growing up and I would hang around with a girl and then people would tell me that I was into this girl and I would think that I was because people were telling me that and I was like, well, maybe I am. You know, I do seem to like hanging around this person a lot, so maybe I do like them. And ultimately, I did like them, just not in that way. Mishima just does a really good job, again, of capturing this process of self-delusion, of trying to be something that you aren't, and ultimately it failing and not working. In fact, if there is one positive aspect to the book, and one may maybe you know, good conclusion about the book, it is that by the end of the novel, Ko-chan at least seems like he has learned not to 
delude himself in these ways as much as he used to. Again, it isn't clear what his ultimate feelings towards his sexuality are, that stays kind of ambiguous, but it does feel as though he's on the path to at least accepting he is just the way that he is, and even if he still has to hide that, he's not going to go too far in trying to hide it by, you know, falling in love with someone that he can't fall in love with. But of course, as the reader, we have no idea where things are going to go, because the story does just kind of end with a lot of these issues unresolved, and you know, that can be frustrating, you know, you want a story to have this more resolute conclusion, but I think in this case, the open-endedness, the ambiguity, the stuff that I've been talking about, really worked excellently, and yeah, I just think it was a very good, perfect story. Part 5, Conclusion. So, if you're interested in reading a very stark, dark, but honest picture of sexual repression, then I think Confessions of a Mask is definitely the, the book that you should go for. Not only do I think you will find a lot of truth in this book, and if you've been through those kinds of experiences, a lot to relate to, but it is also just a beautifully written book, regardless of all of those themes. Mishima has a very poetic style of writing, it's beautiful, it is complex without being, you know, stilted or forced or pretentious, and it all makes sense given the character of Ko-chan and who he is as a person. Also, with respect to Ko-chan himself, like with, you know, Villette and Lucy Snow, we just have a incredibly multifaceted personality that we get to follow, and you know, it's no wonder that Ko-chan has trouble understanding himself, because he is just such a complex character, and there is so much going on in his mind, and so it's definitely a novel that you can just read again and again and again, and always find new things to think about, new things to talk about. So yeah, I think this was a fantastic book, with lots of interesting things to talk about, and I think you should definitely give it a read if you haven't. Okay, that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel. I post new videos every Monday at 4pm UK time. Do let me know in the comments what you think of this book if you've read it, and what you think I should review next or should look at in the future. I look forward to having those discussions with you all in the comments. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all next time.